Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Adam here for our Saturday morning uh, live Q&A or AMA, the question and answer period or ask me anything period provided, provided it's on a topic that I'm qualified to talk about. So all things business, all things marketing, social media, lead gen, advertising, anything like that. Don't ask me about anything else. No, no crypto, no finance. Those would be, those would be uh, off topic subjects that I'm neither uh, qualified nor overly interested in. However, anything I can do to help you grow your business, start a business in regards to sort of setting up structures and productivity and teams, we'll have a chat. So I'm going to open up uh, a new chat window here and we'll get things rocking and rolling. There's a couple things that I want to cover real quick to make sure that we're all on the same page here. <laughs> the first of which is if you can hear me, after last week's um, technical issues, essentially what ended up happening was I was trying out some new streaming software and none of the audio was working, which means that we had to like abort the live, we had to start a new live, we had to go into uh, plug in the old school iPods and try to go through that way and it, it ended up resolving okay, but wanna make sure that you can actually hear me okay and that the chat works. So if you can say hi, We'll make sure that works there and that you can hear me loud and clear. And then I've got some cool news to share with you. Ah, we got a thumbs up. Hopefully that means you can hear. Hey, Kevin, good morning. You're becoming like a regular, uh, a regular Saturday morning participant here. It's good to see you, my friend. Hey, cow. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. What is up? I wonder if I can add some of these as well. There's some neat things that we can do. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Look how fancy we're getting here. We're adding comments. We're doing all kinds of neat things. So that's cool. I wonder if I can add multiple ones at once or if it'll just get, oh, that's cool. It's going to replace it. Hey, good morning, Adderley. Thank you very much. Well, talk with Jason Marnie. Hey, good morning, guys. Crisp, good morning. Yes, you can hear me. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's great. That's great. Tracy, hey, and good morning. Recently started following you. Good to have you along, Tracy. Uh, Saketh, what are marketing strategies work for clothing industry? Excellent. We're going to talk questions and answers in one minute. I've also got a bit more time today. So the kids don't start soccer for like another couple hours. So I've penciled out one hour this morning. So we're going to go from 7.30 a.m. probably right up till 8.30. And then we're going to we're gonna have to hard stop it there. Also, um, next week, I'm going to try and do a better job of scheduling this ahead of time with this software that I'm using right now because I think we're going we're gonna to make it work a little better and then it'll be easy for everybody to hop in. So... Let's talk shop real quick. And then we want to dive into the question and answer period because this is what this is really all about, giving you what you need in, in regards to helping you grow your business. So been having some interesting conversations lately with friends and colleagues and mentors and, um, and agencies and other people that I work with, um, both as clients and, and people that have hired to help me. And there's been one really interesting piece or style of content that just keeps coming up again and again, and we can't seem to get away from it. And that is probably no surprise, but short form vertical video. So think uh, Instagram reels, think Facebook reels, think TikTok, think YouTube shorts. Now this kind of content has some very good pros in regards to getting expanded organic reach right now, being shown to more people, the algorithms are favoring it. It also has some pretty significant cons to it, some pretty big negative aspects and something that you need to keep in mind when you're creating this kind of content, namely the fact that it simply does not have the power to establish that trust and that authority and that um, that level of connection with your audience that you do through a longer form kind of content, like a long form video, a podcast, even a, even a long form written blog. Simply kind of common sense, right? But the, the time that someone engages and interacts with that content is just so much shorter. That said, we started doing more and we're going to be doubling down on it and we're going to be doing even more across this channel, across all kinds of other channels for a couple different reasons. The first of which is because the algorithm is pushing it a lot right now. Like whether we're talking TikTok or Instagram reels, YouTube shorts have finally kind of like updated their algorithm. So it's a little bit better, but it also gives you the ability to like rapid fire test different content ideas and different hooks and what your market and what your audience wants to see, what they care about so that you can double down there and create longer form content after that. Very, very powerful tool, easier to use, right? Than say, hey, go out there, start a new YouTube channel and start making long form videos, which there's definitely a learning curve. Uh, but the short form video stuff, fantastic. Next, you're able to leverage one single piece of short form vertical video content. We're going to need a, an acronym there. And you're able to use it not only in organic across all of the different platforms. You can post it on Twitter and LinkedIn and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. I don't know if I'm missing any there, but like that same piece of content. But not only that, you can run advertising to that same piece of content. 
So now you've got organic content, you have ads, and my recommendation is that I start with organic, I find out which content resonates and does best, then I can support that by running ads to it. So a couple different ways of doing it, but a phenomenally, phenomenally powerful tool. So with that said, there's our, our warning and our message for the week for things we want to look at. And now let's hop into questions. I'm going to do my best to get them in order. Let's start with Saketh here. Uh, what are the marketing strategies work for clothing industry? So it's cool. I like these questions because you could almost replace clothing industry with um, any other kind of textiles or any kind of e-com or any kind of fashion. It's like people often think that a specific strategy or a tactic is only going to work in one industry, in one market, and that's it. And like, that's the thing. The reality is, is if it works for one, it's probably going to work for others. Uh, the the underlying principles of marketing and of business, they're they're universal fundamentals. They're principles. They're they're these things that work across all of the different industries. So really, it comes down to kind of the basics. It's like, all right, well, if we're talking about clothing industry, we're probably talking more about brand than we are like direct response marketing. So we do need to have some kind of aspirational, identity based brand there. Otherwise, you do just become a commodity. It's like a t-shirt, right? Like, it's just a t-shirt. Now, why why am I wearing this kind of t-shirt, for example, opposed to another one? It's like, well, there's the fit. There's the fact that I know how it looks. I've bought from the company a bunch before. I like the material. Um, I identify with the brand. It's kind of like this classic, minimal men's style. Uh, so I just keep going back to them again and again. So now that they've got me, I'm just going to keep buying their shirts until I find something better or different. So getting that first sale is going to be important, but you, you do need to build a brand around something like that. Um, as far as how to do that, it depends where your market is present and active online. You've got to go there. So identify who your core segment is. All right. Thato. Hi from South Africa. Hello. Hello. What? Oh man. What time is it there? It's got to be... How far ahead are you? It's got to be like late evening, late afternoon, early evening. Um, but best marketing tools for a food business, again, very similar, right? It's like, you're, obviously there's nuances and details and we can talk about those. But if you get the fundamentals right, you're kind of like 80 to 90% there already. Anything else is just icing on the cake. Oh, that's a good food pun. Uh, so best marketing tools for a food business, presumably it's local. Presumably you're selling uh, D to C, direct to consumer. In this case, I like any local kind of um, any kind of local channel. Obvious ones being, say, Facebook. Um, you can do local targeting somewhat with Instagram. You can run local, locally targeted ads with both of those platforms. That's phenomenal. But also take a look at what country geographic specific platforms you have, whether it's Yelp or Google Business Profile, or are there some other kind of local chamber of commerce things? Like really getting involved in the local community goes a really long way. And like that is a significant competitive advantage that you can have over other people in the industry is kind of doing those unscalable things. Ah, Liz, good morning. Good morning. Messiad Kamran. I have a question. I already ask what tool I use for 400 million emails from uh, email marketing. Yeah, you have asked that. I remember. Okay. So here's the deal. If you've got these emails, this is the same for anybody, which is why I'm happy to dive into this one in a little bit, um, a little more detail. If you've come across a, a list, right? So you've acquired a list. There's a couple things that you need to keep in mind. The first of which is where did you get this list? Most lists that you're going to find or scrape or whatever, you're not legally, technically allowed to email cold. Like you can't spam people. You can't just send out 400 emails. Um, not to mention you wouldn't want to cause your return on investment of your time and money and that just wouldn't be effective. Let's assume for some weird reason you acquired 400, 400 million legitimate emails, which I'm going to strongly doubt there. Let's assume though you got these. Um, there's a ton of different softwares out there you can use. There's uh, woodpecker. There's, uh, what are the other ones? Can't remember them off the top of my head, but if you type in like cold email outreach, you'll find a number of different automated platforms. The secret there is you never want to run it through your own email platform because you're going to get marked as spam and blocked and things like that. So you do want to run it through another party's software. I don't have like, I don't like this strategy, so I don't use it. So I don't recommend it. So I don't have a lot of experience with it. I'd rather generate emails through permission marketing, have somebody like actively raise their hand and be like, yes, I'm interested in that. Tell me more about it. And then I can reach out to them rather than me just scraping things and trying to find them. So hopefully that helps. There's no way to do it for free um, that I'm aware of. Doesn't mean that doesn't exist. 
you're going to have to pay. And for 400 million emails, I mean, that's it's going to be cost prohibitive um, in the in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So I, I don't like that strategy particularly. Isaac, hey, I've been learning a lot from your channel. Thanks. Awesome, my friend. Good. Uh, glad you're finding it useful. Ah, pilot, cost to learn marketing. Great question. So um, anywhere from free to a million dollars. How's that for a world's worst answer? So let's let's talk about the spectrum. On one side of the spectrum, you have free. So I'm talking about uh, YouTube channels, YouTube videos just like this one. Um, Google, amazing, right? Like pretty much anything and everything you want to do, you're going to pay in time rather than money. So I guess that's a better way to look at the spectrum. It's like on one end, you've got things that are going to take you a ton of time, but cost $0. That's that's basically what I started with. So any book that I could find, I mean, even Kindle books, right? Like 10 bucks a book, a buck a book, five bucks, like very inexpensive considering the volume and quality of information. in. So that's one side. The other side is like a marketing degree from Wharton or Yale or Harvard or Stanford or something like that. Let's Let's say 50 grand a year, four years, 200 grand. Um, is one better than the other? Not really. I mean, if anything, the free one's probably better than the degree. It's like the reason you go to those schools is to literally get the degree because a lot of their information on how to do marketing is available free online now, thanks to the whole um, uh, Rony Rona thing, which, which made a lot of schools transition online, which made a lot of students angry that they were paying this amount of money for the certification, for that degree and thing on their wall. Now, if you want to take a conventional route, my recommendation, I actually just gave this yesterday, uh, a local community college in your area that does like a business degree or something like that. And even if you only took the first year, so it's like take two semesters of business and you're going to learn marketing 101. You're going to learn accounting and finance and economics, macro and micro. You're going to learn um, some other finance, math and statistics. And like you're going to get this really broad, overarching sense of business. Everything after that's kind of like nice to have, but not necessarily needed. And I probably learned more from books. Um, I definitely learned more from books and courses and mentors than I ever did from school. So I don't regret going to school. Uh, I think it was great, taught me some things, um, but it, it made like 1% of my education, if, if that, honestly. Ah, good morning, architectural sheet metal. Good to see you again. We've got some familiar returning faces. This is fantastic. Okay, man, your content is helping us starting our business. We have a pool service in South Florida. Oh, excellent. That's cool. Okay. That's amazing. Um, pool service, same deal. Locally targeted Facebook ads, phenomenal. It's like I would just literally target like my my city plus or minus 10 miles around it. I'd run all kinds of different ads, probably a combination of like reels, probably some post ads, maybe carousels. I'd also run straight up lead gen ads like click to call or um, lead ads. I might run ads that click to messenger, but I have depends on your market and if they're willing to respond to that. A good thing for you, my friend, is you're going to want to look up this. Um, do, 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 because I'm going to put it in the chat if I can. I've got a link for it and I'll see if I can remember to put it in later. But what I would do is I'd run like the Facebook lead ads into this software and then have them automatically follow up with an SMS. That is is probably my preferred method for local marketing like that. All right, scrolling back up. We we got a lot of good stuff here. Keep going, keep going. Mohammed, good evening from Bangladesh. Good evening, my friend. Audio on point today. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we I finally figured it out. Um, it's actually, I wish it was more of a software thing. Believe it or not, it actually came down to like the box that I was using and it has this, like this mic doesn't have any power. You have to run something called phantom power through it and it was off and it was a, a disaster. So hello, Andoria. Um, eyeballs. Yes, my views are set up, but I don't think it equates to true growth. Okay. Can't bring views to the bank. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the difference between say brand awareness and direct response marketing. So one of the most common, um, complaints, questions, issues that people have with marketing is that, Hey, I'm doing all this stuff, but like nothing's working or it's working and I'm getting uh, what I call vanity metrics. So you're getting likes, comments, shares, engagement, uh, but no dollars, no sales. And often this is just a case of, of not having the right funnel in place and not having like a, like really strategically thought through the process of, all right, well, if the end result is a sale, what needs to happen before that? Is it a conversation, a website visit, an application form, whatever? And if that's that, what needs to happen before that? Is it a view, a this, a that, or whatever? 
And then what kind of view and what kind of content and what kind of person? And then we just sort of step our way backwards, reverse engineering the sales process. Also, a lot of the content that's being put out there is not necessarily designed to drive sales. And that's okay. It's like we can have content for the sake of content's sake, but when you're putting out stuff with the intention of making a sale, we need to make it very clear and we need to track it. So we should set up some kind of link tracking. We should at least be looking at like how many clicks to our website are going. Um, like if you don't want to get super nerdy on this, you can literally just set up a basic Google Analytics account or I use software called um, Fathom. I'll try to remember to put a link in that one as well, which is like a fancier Google Analytics. And what that allows you to do is track how many people are going to your website and then you can set up a conversion event to be, all right, well, we're optimizing for applications or calls or sales or whatever it is. And then you can see what your conversion rate is on your page. So I wish there was an easier way to do this, but like this is kind of the whole point of marketing. So we have to find a way to make those effective calls to action, to put together those good offers and to have, find a way to convert them into sales. So we can talk about specifics there later. All right, Facebook marketing strategy when starting a new page. Uh, same as everything. I mean, it's tough. Like if you're starting from scratch and you don't have another audience to leverage and to to sort of share that with, like it's going to come down to just content 101. I'm not a big fan of running ads to build page likes and followers and things like that. I think it has to be done organically through outreach, through joining groups, through posting content. Um, the big the big question for me, Mohammed, is like, is a Facebook page really going to be the best use of your time for the market that you want to get to? And if you want to be selective, do we even need an organic strategy or could we just like cut that out completely? and and go straight to ads not ads to build the page but ads to make a sale where building the page is a beneficial byproduct of actually making the sale that's my best approach when it comes to like building up an organic following through paid ads any kind of following that you get should always be a natural byproduct of running ads towards a sale towards something that's going to deliver a tangible and real return on investment ROI. So if I'm putting in a dollar, I want to be getting at least two dollars back out. And then if I get likes and comments and shares on that, that's fantastic. That's sort of, again, icing on the cake, gravy on the whatever. But that's never my primary goal. Otherwise, you're going to go broke really quick. Uh, and Doria, what do you recommend to improve my English? I am not an English teacher. So study, watch videos. Um, there's an amazing website called Preply, uh, P R E P L Y. Um, I'm, I'm studying Spanish right now. And I'm, so I hired a Spanish instructor, uh, and then I talk with him a couple times a week and we go over all kinds of stuff. So that's probably the best way. Otherwise I, I wish I could help you more. Citra. Hello. Um, all right. What tool is best for email marketing and send massive email without spam? Same question, my friend, same question. Uh, Again, you're going to need to Google cold email marketing software. I've used Woodpecker before. There's another one I have that I just cannot remember for the life of me right now. But if you Google that, you're going to find it. You're still going to get marked as spam, but you tend to use like throwaway domains. So it's not that big a deal uh, with it. Then again, it's still not my favorite approach by far. I think I've made that clear. All right. How can I target two different audiences profitably? Excellent. This is a deeper one. The first question, and this is the this is the coach in me. It's like, why do we want to, right? It's like I'd go after the the audience that is most profitable to me. Now, if I don't know, if I've got two different audiences and I was like, I don't know, I'd probably pick one still. But if I couldn't convince you to pick one and you're just you're gonna go do this anyway, you can test them both, but you're gonna want to do this with um a couple different ways. The first of which is way more effort, and it's essentially setting up separate organic profiles designed at each market. The easier way is to run ads. So essentially you take the same offer, you dress it up with like, um, I don't know, say you're going after like plumbers and roofers. So I have an ad and I target plumbers and I was like, Hey, are you a plumber that needs this? Go do this. And then I target roofers and I was like, are you a roofer that needs this? Go do this. And then I measure the results. That's it. Very, very simple. I'd still double down on one. Um, but if you don't know, that's where we start. All right. SST life. Good to see ya. Nicola, in terms of bringing new clients to an agency, what would your suggestion be? All right. So this is very much B2B marketing. Um, it depends on, I'm going to, we'll assume just a, your standard agency model. So marketing agency, creative agency, some kind of um, services based business like that. Essentially what you need to do 
is, is again, we're coming back to marketing 101. You need to find out who are the clients that you serve best and get the best results for. And then we go after them almost exclusively at the, at the expense of everybody else. We just ignore them and we focus in on our best people. Then we figure out what are their biggest pain points that we're able to solve better than our competition. How are we able to do that? What's our competitive advantage, our unique selling proposition, our USP, our points of differentiation. Then we find out where are they present and active online and offline. Um, if we're talking like really big fish agency stuff, like six, seven figure contracts and that, I have no problem doing very slow nurture and uh, outreach. I, d I typically don't do cold email or cold calling. I'll cold email occasionally, but like direct mail or showing up in person, not obviously unannounced and standing outside the front door, but like, you know, making an effort to really go that extra mile. If it's smaller services, um, finding out what groups they're in, how do I identify them and target where they're at? Once that's done, then I need some kind of compelling offer to get them in the door. So I want to essentially sell them what they, or offer them, sell them what they need, and then I'm gonna give them um, all of the other stuff that I think after the fact. So for example, if they're coming for Facebook ads, I just want Facebook ads, just help me with Facebook ads. I was like, cool, we'll, we'll help you with Facebook ads. Let's take a look, what are you running right now? What is this good? Bring them in, and then I can be like, cool, now that we've had a look at this, my recommendation is actually maybe Google ads or SEO, or like we figure we could lower your cost per acquisition by 30% by looking at this channel instead, et cetera. So you've got to go in by giving the market what they want. Um, but it's really just comes down to understanding who they are and what message is going to resonate most with them. All right. Yeah. My pleasure, my friend, my pleasure. Uh, any tips on email marketing? I feel that I don't have that much content for three to four times a week. Yeah. Right on. So, Email marketing is a funny beast of all the, of, it's funny, of all of the strategies that I talk about and, um, and tactics and um, suggestions on creating content and say this and don't say that and be polarizing here or controversial there or whatever it is. The thing that I get the most kickback on by far is the frequency um, with I, that I suggest emailing. So I suggest emailing three to four times a week. So, so good for you for knowing that number. Um, and once in a while, someone will respond back to one of my emails, like, and they'll, they'll write back and they'll say, um, this is crazy. It's too much volume, whatever it is. You should be sending less email, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they don't unsubscribe, which is weird. Sometimes I'll unsubscribe for them just to, to save them the, the hassle, but they, they kick back because they've heard from some other guru or some other business source that, yeah, email, I don't know, once a week or once every two weeks or like, don't overwhelm people. That's such BS. I don't even like, I don't even know where to start. I always want to say, I always get a little bit of, um, I get a little bit aggressive. I, I've yet to like write back a scathing email, but I always want to be like, send me your, send me your revenue report. Like show me your profits, show me where you're getting this information from and like how it's working for you. And the odds are good. If you sort of master sending one decent email a week, naturally, if you up that to two or three and you're providing information and you're speaking in a conversational and authentic style and you're, you're making a connection, like we like those emails. We're fine with those. And if we don't want to read them, we won't read them, but sending them once a week. I mean, let's just look at like average email open rates of 20%. We'll say 25% for, for easy math. So if the average email open rate is 25% and you send one email a week, well, that means it could take up to four weeks for somebody to see your email again, which I promise you by then they, they forgot, they moved on, whatever it is, they're, they're going to mark you as spam. They're going to just get rid of it. So you got to email more. Um, now, if you're just getting started and you're not sure and we don't have enough content for three to four a week, let's start with one to two. Now, one to two, what we could do is we could tell a story, we could show, um, we could provide links to helpful resources, we can embed media, we can show links to videos. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we can do. What I'm always trying to do though, is like we're talking in the context here of like a pool service. What are my people interested in that are also interested in pools? So if they're interested in pools, well, they're probably interested in, in backyard or design or patios or this kind of furniture or these design trends, possibly local events. If I'm a local business, like there's a lot of stuff that you can do, but it very much is a muscle that needs to be developed and strengthened over time. So we've just got to, we got to hop in. We got to make it happen. All right. Best marketing tools for journal business. I'm not sure what you mean by journal business. If you mean selling like hard cover journals and things like that, um, Amazon and Etsy are the best place to sell stuff like that and then build your list. So do anything you can to acquire emails and customer contact information from those sources so you can follow up later. Tracy, what do you use to edit short form videos or reels from phone? I'm more of the strategist, but help with one of my large clients and starting to rebrand myself. Okay, excellent question, Tracy. So I... 
Oh man, there's a few. I don't, let me look at my phone. What do I even have on here? We'll take a look. I think if I looked through some of my applications for video, there's one called Clips that I think I've used probably the most. There's another one called Spark, which I don't mind. Uh, my recommendation is still like, sure, record it on your phone. I'd probably still transfer it to my computer and like do a couple tweaks and edits and adjustments from the computer and then like reshare it back to the phone. I know it's a bit of a pain in the pain in the butt to do it that way. Um, on the computer, we've recently started, we've switched over our editing software. We used to use uh, Premiere Pro, then we used Final Cut Pro forever. Um, we're starting to dive into something called DaVinci Resolve and I, I'm kind of loving it. Um, it's free. Also, there's, there's a paid studio version, which is still very inexpensive compared to other softwares out there, but like it's been really good. So I might look into DaVinci Resolve um, and then do it on your computer. Okay. Isaac, good morning. Best marketing strategy for an import export business. Cool. Import export business. Hit me with the specifics. Give me the details on that one. Um, I need to know what you're importing and exporting, and I need to know who the customers are before I can give you any ideas on that one. And the reason is, is because that almost be like, um, what's a marketing strategy for like the transportation industry? Well, it's going to be very different if we're talking like tourism or airplanes or boats or cruises or whatever it is. So give me some details on that one. I'll see if I can answer it after. And Doria, when I choose a niche in my area, how can I distinguish a client's ads from a second client? Oh, excellent. Excellent question. So the, the big way is through, um, through their branding and logo. Um, the second thing is I would probably worry about it less than you might think. So unless you've got 400, 500 clients, the odds of them like super overlapping in one area, selling the same offer to the same thing to the same people, pretty slim. What I typically would do here, what I, what I used to do more so when I was running um, a similar style of ad for a bunch of people in the same industry is I would just work with one per city or per location. So I'd have the same ad, but it would be like, hey, Jacksonville, hey, Vancouver, hey, um, Silver Lake, hey, whatever. And, and I would just have those people so they had this exclusive area so there was never any overlap. If there is going to be overlap, like say, you're, I don't know, you're running ads for two realtors in the same city, you're going to have to change the creative up. So I don't like to use the same ad creative for both, even though one is going to naturally end up performing better. You're going to have to juggle that a little bit. Um, but it kind of gives a bad taste in the mouth when they like see the exact same ad. That said, other people are going to copy you too. The second that you write a really good ad and people know about it and they see that it's working well, they're just going to copy it, uh, which is very easy to do today. Thanks to um, Facebook's, what do they even call it? Page transparency feature. So if you go to a... Facebook page of a competitor or a colleague, anyone you want to see, you can scroll down in the about section or on the home section. You'll find an area called page transparency. You can see if this page is running ads or not. If they are, you can go to ad library. You can see the ads that are running rule of thumb. Typically the ads that have been running for a really long time are probably working. Otherwise they shouldn't still be running them. And if an ad has been running for a long length of time, um, odds are good that you're going to want to model that one. I wouldn't copy and steal it exactly because that's both unethical and, um, illegal depending on your views of copyright law in your country and so on but uh they're, they're gonna model it all right victor hey good to see ya okay let me see where are we uh citra how to best practice digital marketing to b2b so it's gonna be i i love these questions because b2b b2c d2c direct to consumer which is b2c there's bunch of different acronyms for kind of different same things all at the same time. It's kind of all the same. Uh, I think it was Brian Kramer who wrote the book uh, H to H, Human to Human Marketing. And um, possibly the worst, oh, I don't want to say the worst, that's mean. The, one of the most useless, there's no way around this, we're going there. One of the most useless courses I think I ever took was like um, B2B selling or something like that because it was all about like, outlining the organizational structure and hierarchy and the business decisions that need to be made and identifying all of like just useless crap, like just so much useless stuff. It's, it was ridiculous. The point is it's people that are making decisions. So you need to identify the decision maker and you need to talk to them and you need to find out who the gatekeepers are in front of them in order to get to them. So um, a good example is like if someone's trying to sell me something, 
other than other than now when we can like interact like that it's like i really don't check my email or my direct messages um just because the it's it's just a little too overwhelming there's there's too many hundred to get to so assistants and ops managers and all that go through it so they're going to filter it and then they're going to decide what gets through and what they push on to me same thing with any of the people that you want to reach it's like they're going to have that person that's going to be fielding them so what can you do what can you offer what can you say that's so enticing that they're like I got to show this to Adam. Like, he's going to love this. This is going to be really important. And you've got to identify them. Um, other than that, it's kind of about being everywhere all the time. So it's like, what can you do to increase touch points so that you become the, the main person that they think of when they think of your market or industry? For example, if you go to, well, we're on YouTube now. So maybe we'll wait till after this one. Once this is done, if you go to YouTube and you type in the search bar marketing, I'm not sure about digital marketing, but if you type in marketing, I think I'm either, one of my videos is either number one or number two. Now, granted that took some time and a hundred, 500, 600 videos and five years or whatever we've been doing it for. But the point is, is like when you sort of hit that stage where when someone thinks of an industry, they think of you, they just automatically come to you. So that's kind of our goal here. Obviously that's kind of like the end state that we want to get to. But right now, what can you do to create stuff that's going to put you in front of potential people that are searching for it, that are actively looking for it? What kind of content can you, can you create? What kind of questions can you answer? What kind of um, blogs or podcasts or can you do guest posts or whatever it is? Like that's, that really is the secret is trying to get in front of those people when they're, um, when they're searching. Wealth Talk, what is a good cost per lead on Facebook? Excellent. Um, so it 100% depends on the niche. Um, we're talking Wealth Talk, so I'm going to assume we're talking finance. More expensive than, say, if we're selling um, socks, right? Uh, the, some of the cheapest leads are like fat loss, weight loss leads. So it's like lose 20 pounds in two weeks. You're going to get a ton of leads. They're going to be terrible quality. But it's like you're going to get those for, I don't know, still cheap, like, 40 cents, 50 cents with the right ad, maybe cheaper, maybe a bit more. Um, when we start talking business and finance, we're talking three, four, five, six dollars per lead, which is, and again, if it's like a local business and you're targeting affluent people, maybe more. Um, there was a time when we were paying, this wasn't even that long ago, say two years ago, for like a webinar registration to get someone to attend a webinar in like a business niche. We're paying anywhere from like 10, 15 to 20 dollars per lead for that. If we were doing like weight loss coaching or, or uh, life coaching, even very gen generic general type of things, we were paying four or five, six bucks. So it's going to vary. My recommendation is, again, it depends on your offer, but the real secret is going to be like that compelling offer. So what am I giving them? Am I giving them an audit? Am I giving them a lead magnet, a download? That's the other thing. If we're offering someone like a, a 60 minute free wealth consultation, you're going to spend a fortune for that. Like, 20, 30 bucks, 50, 60, 80 um, to get that lead. Whereas if you're giving them like a free download, 10 steps to accumulate wealth, et cetera, like you may spend three, four or five bucks, but then how many of those are going to convert? So that's where it's important to have your funnel in place. But hopefully that at least gives you some ideas. Um, the bigger thing is I'd be looking at all of my diagnostic metrics ahead of that. So like, what's my CPM, my cost per mill? How much is it costing me to reach a thousand people in this market? And then I'd be looking at my cost per click and my click through rates and my cost per link clicks. And we get nerdy pretty quick, but you, you do want to be mapping these out at every stage. So you can start to see which kind of leads and which kind of offers are generating the best quality for the best cost. <laughs> Two second water break intermission. All right, Bawar, I want to provide village tour and rural experience to foreigner from US, Canada, etc. I made a website about that. How can I get travel lead who are coming to India? Yeah, very cool. I mean, what I would do is I wouldn't probably, unless you've got a, a large enough budget, like you could target people who match like the following eight criteria. So it's like they're frequent travelers. They spend a lot of money. They're affluent. They have an interest in India. They blah, blah, blah. Like you, you could layer and target those people. Not my favorite way. My favorite way would probably be to find, uh, to get listed on some kind of local travel advisory thing. So, um, even not local, like say TripAdvisor or Airbnb as a service, like to start to play in those realms and optimize your profile and offer that way and start accumulating ratings and reviews. That's going to be the thing is it's going to be ratings and reviews and becoming one of the top, um, the top providers. So 
hopefully that helps. It's There's definitely not an easy path there. It's not like we can just run an ad and target everybody who's going to India because we're going to have a, a too small a market. Um, but you can find like the tour operators and the um, uh, travel agents. They, they still exist. Less so, but partnerships there. Okay. Uh, Vikash, do you have any Facebook or any social media group in which I can connect with you? I can connect with your network. Excellent question. Other than here right now, no, not not at the present moment. I'm playing around with memberships. Every time though, I I always um we always go to launch it and then we always we always dial it back just because of the the work involved and um and the structure of running everything. I think there's value in it and I would like to do that. I'm just not sure the best way to do it yet. Whether we run it through like a Reddit group or we run it through probably not a Facebook group because we take it off Facebook, but either a Reddit group or like a circle or school or volley group or something like that. But if you're on the email list, I'll keep you posted. Nothing, nothing yet though. Happy you're finally able to catch the live stream. Yeah, I'm happy it finally works, right? We, finally, we got all the, the uh, technical stuff in order. So that's fantastic. Glad to see you. Okay. True 24 FPS. Oh, filmmaker. Excellent. Hey, from Jersey, Channel Islands. Beautiful. I've never been to Jersey, but I've been to Guernsey. For those of you who are not familiar, the Channel Islands are between England and France, and they're, or, or Europe, we should say, North Europe. And they're these um, two beautiful, very small islands, Jersey and Guernsey. I think those are the two big ones. There's like Isle of Wight way over there, not a Channel Island. That's off Ireland, isn't it? But amazing, amazing places. One book you'd recommend to start better understanding marketing. Oh, I can do you one better. Actually, I'm going to give you one and then I'm going to tease it a bit. I, I literally just put together a video on the top five marketing books. I originally intended to make this video like short and sweet and like, here they are. And it, it just ballooned into, um, uh, into what I think is a very useful video, but it, I, it got out of hand. I got excited. I got really excited. It was just, I couldn't stop writing and talking about it. There's, there's some amazing books on it. Let me give you, I'm going to give you one that I don't talk about in the video and then I'm going to save that because I think the video is coming out this week or next week. And I want to give you that little bit of a cliffhanger to get you coming back because I think you're going to you're gonna really like it. Actually, I'm going to give you two. One of them is going to be super nerdy and the other is going to be very practical and help you understand. So the one that's very practical is going to be Purple Cow by Seth Godin. I'm biased on this one because it was one of the first marketing books that I read that really changed the way that I think about things. And, um, and I can give you the premise of it, which is to be remarkable. So essentially the story is like, if you're driving by field after field of cows, at first, when you see them, you're like, that's amazing. Look at that cow. And then you see another and you're like, that's cool too. And then you see another and you're like, yep, that's a cow. And then you just ignore them from then on. But if you see a purple cow, you pull over, you stop, you take pictures. You're like, what is this thing? And the goal of your business and your offer is to be like truly remarkable, worth making a remark about, which is the definition of remarkable essentially. So it's like, what can you do to like really differentiate yourself? Now I've got friends that I've suggested this book to, and some of them loved it. Some of them were like, nah, it's okay. I've read it dozens of times. I think it's it's that good at like changing your perception about it. So so that's like my my big picture one. The small picture one, which you can buy still from Brian Kurtz. You'll have to search it up. It's like Titans of Direct Marketing or whatever it is. It's 150 bucks, not a cheap book. It's called Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz. Amazing book, incredibly valuable. It was written back in the 60s, like 66, I think. Um, Eugene Schwartz is probably one of arguably the best copywriter of all times, uh, his ability to craft stories and headlines and, and go through the structure and, and to think about where the customer is at in their journey and what you need to say at the right time to show them that you understand. And like, it's, it's a power packed book. In fact, I'd, I'd be willing to say like, if you, if you spend the $150 and you buy this book and you read it like two or three times, it's going to be worth like 10 other marketing books. Um, I don't cover it in the video because it's, it's definitely a lot more high level and a lot more advanced, but it's, it's powerful. That's how you tell a true marketing nerd too. It's like, you know, you're dealing with like a true marketer when they've got or read breakthrough advertising in, in some way sense. Okay. Let's see. How are we doing? We got 20 more minutes. Let's keep going. Um, and Dory, I'm in the last year of high school. How do you, do you advise to continue studying at university or not to continue and learn marketing from courses in YouTube, which is better? Oh yeah. This is such a personal judgment question. Um, without like, 
it so depends, right, on, on your goals and your financial situation and what school you're going to be going to. So let me give you some like generic broad answers that'll be useful to anybody listening as well, because I don't know your specific situation. We'd have to we'd have to talk in depth before I was able to give you like a, a piece of life advice. Like go do this thing. Um, for the most part, if your goal is to learn marketing and to master marketing, if you were to spend four years at a university or four years uh, aggressively self-studying while still continuing to work. So it's like, say, I don't know, you do four hours a day for four years, six hours a day. You're going to learn so much more on your own. It's not even funny. Like it's, it's not even close. Um, when I went through school to do marketing, all of my education came before, during and after class and it continues to this day. So every single day I still do at least minimum one hour of quote unquote study a day minimum. So podcasts, books, courses, mentors, coaches, masterminds. I'm, I mean, as many as I can, I soak up as much as I can. Like it never ends, right? Like you're always trying to learn and stay ahead of things. The problem with school and universities is that by the time a textbook gets published, it's kind of out of date, uh, especially when it comes to like digital marketing and things like that. I've told the story a few times, but it's still one of my favorites. Like when I went through school, um, I had a services marketing professor at the front of the class and he's like, Hey, who tell me like write down on this paper, what do you want to learn? And I'll go through it. So I wrote down digital marketing and he got to mind. He opened it up. He's like, yeah, me too. And I was like, Oh man, I'm in the wrong place. This is not going to go well. Um, and it was fine. I learned the basics and the fundamentals and you'll learn like segmentation and positioning and differentiation and all of those things. But again, you can learn that from a book and it's not that hard, like the basics of it. So it's hard for me to recommend school. I think I, I'm going to echo my previous point that I made earlier that if you go to like a first year community college and you take like a business marketing or a business certificate, you're going to get most of what you need and the rest you're going to be able to do on your own. The exception is if the job that you're dreaming for needs a quote unquote degree from this place, which less and less of them are these days. All right. Jocko and Marnie, if you had to invest into one, which would it be a website or a funnel for marketing? Hmm. Where's my traffic coming from? Like, to me, they're kind of, I'm going to make them kind of synonymous. So it's like, to me, my website is a funnel. Um, like, I'm going to have it send people where I need them to go. So if I have a choice of like a landing page that sends somebody a lead magnet that drives them through some kind of follow-up sequence with email and whatever it is, or like a, a standalone website that's like, hey, I'm Adam, listen to me. Like, I'm going to go the funnel way, right? Um, so it depends on what the purpose of both are. If I'm running paid traffic, let's do it this way. If I'm running paid traffic, Facebook ads, Google ads, whatever it is, I'm getting a funnel, which means I'm sending people to a landing page with one specific core offer, get this free thing, do this thing. I'm putting them into an email follow-up sequence, possibly with SMS. I'm following up. I'm doing all of the right things there. If, on the other hand... People are naturally finding me. I'm local, so therefore I'm not doing paid ads. I'm doing more organic. I'm building the website, and it's going to be basic, and it's going to have the um, like the about page and the services page, but that's going to give me a place that I can send everybody to. So my answer is, you need both, um, but you don't need a fancy website. It's like you can build one for I don't know, fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, like Squarespace, Wix, um, Hostinger. Uh, name cheap, like all of these have like templates already installed that you can just go and click and install. Um, you can find a, a designer on Fiverr or Upwork and they can put together something basic for you. So kind of no excuse not to have a website. Uh, and then a funnel's awesome, but a lot more work. All right. Architectural sheet matter. A lot of my audience is on Facebook. Ads would work, but I'm not an ad expert and find them a little intimidating. Is there some sort of beginner process I can follow? Okay, yes, very much so. So ads for most people are intimidating and I, I agree and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think I like that they're still intimidating and they're trying to make them less intimidating, which I actually don't like. And the reason is, is because ads are not easy and they're promised as like a silver bullet. They're promised as like you run this ad, you get all these new customers and clients and sales. And I was like, yes, if. If the ad is good, if the offer is good, if the um, the page that they end up on is optimized, like there's so many pieces to the puzzle, and this is the reason that I've got um, what's the right word? 
trying to be polite here this happy Saturday morning. I've, I've got like a, a bone to pick or a, a gear to grind um, with, with so many marketing agencies and, and marketers out there is that they they get Facebook ads clients and they throw some stuff up and it doesn't work and they claim that they're getting likes and comments and shares but no sales. Um, it's because they, they're really failing to understand the mechanics behind like why ads work and why they don't and how to structure an offer and how to, how to make sure that your lifetime value is even worthwhile of running an ad in the first place. For example, if you're selling something for $50, uh, you might need to spend $100 to make a sale and then you just lost 50 bucks per sale. So you actually want to make as few as possible. Otherwise you go broke. On the other hand, if you've got something that's high ticket enough, thousand bucks, 2000 bucks, whatever, then you can run ads to it uh, all day long, provided that your, your metrics are in place. Um, good example, my flagship course, Digital Marketing Academy. Right now that's selling for $297 and I am not running ads to it. Why not, Adam? You've been running ads for your whole life. You run ads for everybody. Why don't you run ads for yourself? I'm talking to myself, it's getting weird. Uh, but the reason is, is because I, I tested some things out of curiosity and the cost per acquisition to run an ad to get a sale was around 100, 150, maybe 200. But I found that it, it didn't quite make enough sense because the time and the energy that it took me to sort of set up the campaign and to monitor it, yes, I could get help, but I'm kind of a control freak when it comes to my own stuff bad thing to be. Don't be like me. Get help. Um, it, it didn't make sense. I was better off investing the money into creating more content, hiring another team member, getting someone else to help with the organization and the structure of the business and the editing and the posting and so on. So you've got to make an individual judgment call. Now, as far as is there an easy way to get set up and running? Yes, for sure. I put a video out. It was actually sponsored by Facebook. Now, Meta, um, last week, week before on like how to use Meta technologies to generate leads. And I talked a lot about like Facebook lead ads, ads that uh, click to call ads and ads that click to message. Three very simple campaigns to structure. I would run those. And if you want to test, I would probably run like um, click to call ads first. I'd also probably put my phone number like in the ad itself and be like, here's this thing. We have this thing. Do you want this thing? Call us. We can do this thing. I'm not even kidding. That sounds really dumb, but it's like it would polish it a little bit more, but like make it very clear. There's no need to be creative or whatever it is. Um, like some of the ads you'll see, I'm, I'm going to do another video on this at some point, but like some of my best performing ads, like they take me a day or two to write. Like no, no joke. Like I'll write the ad. I'll sleep on it. I'll come back. I'll re-edit it. I might rewrite it again. Like some of them take a long time. So just go direct, make the ad, put the thing out there, see what works, start small, five bucks, 10 bucks a day. Um, and you can learn that way. Best place to learn probably uh, YouTube, there's another guy named um, Ben Heath who's got good stuff on Facebook ads here on YouTube. Wes McDowell has good stuff on Facebook ads as well. So if you look at those two other channels, they've got some some good stuff. All right. <clears throat> Orbin, I'm part of a marketing agency in my home country and... Oh, hang on, we got cut off. Let's try the next part. Uh, need to ask, what are marketing agencies missing nowadays? I say video marketing, but what is your perspective? Okay, excellent question. What most marketing agencies are missing right now is, um, I was gonna be such a fluffy question, such a fluffy answer, but bear with me. They're actually missing focus. Um, so when I look at a marketing agency and, uh, and I do an analysis of like their services and what they're doing, most of them, just like most businesses in general, they're doing way too much stuff. Like they're offering way too many services and way too many packages. They're trying to serve way too many niches, and way too many clients, and they're, they're getting watered down and they become this uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So they don't have a clear, compelling value proposition. They have a like, yeah, I'll do your Facebook ads and your SEO and write your content and send your emails and design a funnel and wash your car and walk your dog. And they do all of the things, but nothing that really sets them apart from everybody else out there. Not to mention, it makes it overwhelming for the client to try to decide what to do. So that's the first answer. Um, as far as what they're missing, yeah, video marketing for sure. Uh, like, it's funny, what, what are we now? Like 2022, going into 2023, at the end of the quarter, whatever it is. It's like, that's how are we still talking about this where people are hesitant or not like fully adopting and embracing video marketing? It, it blows my mind. Like it kind of blew my mind back in 2018 when we're like, look at the graphs and why are more people doing it? The fact that they're not enough people are doing it now means they're sitting on, they're like just wasting, losing money tons of potential money. It's got to be video. I know even if you hate video, there are alternatives, but you got, you've got to find a way somehow to make it. So that's, that's step one. The second thing is, is making sure that what you're offering is in alignment with what your market actually wants. So a lot of people offer 
content marketing services or social media management or this or that or the other thing. Um, but it may not be what the clients actually want. And I think to, to qualify that even one more time, all the clients care about is results. So a lot of marketing agencies kind of get off on the fact that they run an ad campaign or they run a social media organic campaign for someone and they build them up likes and comments and shares and they show the client a pretty graph and a report and they're like, look at all these likes. Look at that. Oh, man, we did that. We got you all these likes. And the business is like, cool, here's another three grand, five grand, one grand, whatever it is. And they keep doing it until three months later and they're like, hey, we're, um, we're not making any money. And they're like, yeah, but look at the likes terrible, right? It's like the closer that you're able to tie what you're doing to a direct business outcome, i.e. revenue, i.e. customer generation, the, the better your agency is going to be. So you don't have to charge based on results, but you need to be a results driven agency. So I think that is my, my big rant and hopefully that helps anyone who's in a marketing agency or who's going to hire a marketing agency. All we care about is results. All the good ones care about is results. Adderley, while we're on the subject of email marketing, how can I prevent my emails from being sent to the spam folder? Any tips? Yes, many tips. Um, if you're getting sent to the spam folder, a couple of things could be happening. Number one is your email could at this point just be a bit blacklisted, which means that you've sent enough stuff in the past where Google and Hotmail and Outlook and all of them are like, mm -mm, you're, not, you're not getting in. So we might need a new email. That's rarely the case though. The second thing is watch what words you're using in your subject line and also in your body of your email. So if you send stuff out like free and discount and get this and like anything kind of spammy looking, they're going to flag it as spam. They're going to get rid of it. Third thing, fourth thing, I don't know, I've lost count. Um, how many links are you putting in your emails? Like, is it just loaded with links? Click this, click this, get this discount, get this free, get this. That's going to spam. Uh, fourth, fifth thing, next thing. Uh, HTML emails. If you're sending emails that look like a flyer that you got in the mail with like a banner at the top and spitting all over my mic, a banner at the top and like images and videos and embeds and things like that. I mean, it looks like spam. So the email is going to send it to spam. If you're not already on my email list, highly recommend it. If you go to adamerhart.com slash newsletter, um, let me type that in here and take a look at how I structure my emails. There is a very strategic reason that they're written like this. They're, they're written like I write to my friend, like you're my friend and I'm going to give you some marketing stuff. We're going to have a chat. There's no banners. Rarely do I embed images. And even then it's, um, they're, they're very small. They're not overly excessively fancy or flashy or anything like that. Um, no more than like two to three links per email. Rarely do I say like free and get this thing. And, and it's not crazy hyped up also. I've been sending them this way for a lot of years now. So my, my uh, domain, the sending domain is, is relatively safe. So there was a time when a lot of them went to spam when I was testing out different things and was just doing all kinds of things wrong years and years ago. And they, a lot of them went to spam. So you can recover. There is a way out of this tunnel, but hopefully those help send conversational emails that look like emails, not flashy marketing that looks like marketing. All right. Eight minutes. Let's see, I'm gonna burn through as many as I can here and then we are gonna wrap it. So, doo 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 doo. Tiago, hey Adam, thanks for answering questions. My pleasure. How to deal with founder's disease as an employee? I love them, the product is great, but they see marketing as a nice thing to have. All right, fill me in on founder's disease as an employee. I love them, the product is great, but they see marketing as a nice to have. Okay, so I assume. You're talking about like the founders of the company are amazing people and they have a great product and they're like, but we don't need marketing. It's not, we don't need it. We're cool. We're going to grow. Um, so this is what I say. Oh, I've got a couple thoughts on this one. The first of which is that it's different if you're an employee of the company, because I don't, I don't like to, I wouldn't just turn my back and walk away and be like, you don't get it. Forget it. Forget you. This is never going to happen. Um, that's how I typically treat people that aren't employees. So if like someone comes to me and they're like, convince me why I need marketing. I'm typically like, yeah, if you don't think you need it, it's, it's not my job. It's like, I, I like to preach to the converted. So all like, you need to know that you need it. Otherwise there's nothing I can do. That's going to help you. It's like, it, it's to me, it's kind of obvious why you need marketing. I think what ends up happening with a business like this is that they've misconstrued. They've confused marketing with like hardcore advertising. Um, and that's not marketing. Marketing is communicating value. It's talking about your products and how they help people. It's talking about the people you help. It's telling stories about the people you help. It's telling about why this is a better solution. It's showing up to provide value and to, to make a connection. That's marketing. 
So they might not need advertising. They might not need, they definitely don't need like a billboard downtown or like a flashy thing in Times Square. They don't need a Super Bowl ad. They don't need any of that garbage. But they do need to be active and present online and offline maybe where their potential customers are. And we need to be having that conversation because if you're not, someone else is. The other thing is, there's this expression, a quote that I absolutely love, which is the best time to, uh, a Japanese Zen philosophy quote, I believe. Um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Meaning, now's the time to start. Like, we should have started a long time ago, so we could have built up a runway, but that's cool. We can start today. The worst time to start marketing is when you need to. If you start to experience a slowdown in business and now you're scrambling to get more customers, like you've already lost the battles, the battle's over because like, where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to get the time? Like now you're panicking. You're, you're forced to think in these like short term, how are we going to make payroll this month versus like, how are we going to set the company up long term? So you need to market all the time. One of the best pieces of advice I got a, a long, long time ago, 10 plus years ago that I, that I started doing right away was to take a portion of my business's revenue and like reinvest that back into my marketing. In the early days, this was nothing because I was making nothing. But I remember spending like five bucks a day on Facebook ads and trying to learn them and trying to figure it out and like promote my company. And then the business grew and it became 10 bucks a day. And then the business grew and it was 20 and then 50 and then 100. And then, okay, what if we hired this team member and then this team member? And soon enough, sooner than later, you'll, you'll realize that your marketing starts making a return on investment. Your company starts to grow. Your revenues start to increase. You're able to invest more and more to the point that there becomes a gap where now to spend, I don't know, 10, 50, 100 grand a month or whatever, it's like, yeah, it's part of the expense, but your competitors that are coming in, they're not going to spend that kind of money. That's insane. But you can because you've started to funnel a portion of it off of your business over a period of time. Again, it's kind of like a muscle, like investing. Um, people talk about this in philanthropy as well. People are like, I'm, uh, I'll give away money when, I'm, uh, uh, when I have $10 million. I'll give away a million. I was like, nah, you probably won't. I was like, it's a lot harder to give away a million dollars than it is to give away $10 out of a hundred. It's like, that's, it's a muscle that needs to be built up. Same with marketing. All right, Kathy. Oh, you're too kind. My pleasure. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. Doing a social media calendar, best way to do it and best tool to use. Yeah. I'm going to drop another link in here. This is the one that I'm using as of now. Um, it's the one I've been using for a while. Uh, it's, it's my favorite one. Um, you can use the free one. I've got the paid one cause it gives me access to all kinds of analytics and things like that. But I like to structure it with this one cause it allows me to post to basically all of the networks that I need and then, um, uh, essentially manage track, do everything. It's yeah, it's powerful. Easy. Okay. How are we doing? Three minutes. Let me see if I can get a couple more in here real quick. And then we're going to try to do this again. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, let's see. Big long splash pages for long essays, public work. Do I agree? Uh, Anthony, I kind of agree. Like, we'll talk this one real quick. Um, big long essays only work for US public, not the UK. Again, you've got to be, it's so, people are people. It's like, yeah, there's, there's cultural and uh, contextual nuances between like how we say things. I say tomato, you say tomato. Um, but like, no, what typically works well in one industry, provided that it's a similar culture, that's the big thing, will work often as well. We might need to tweak some things, but that's it. Okay, let's see if I can find one more that I think will help the most amount of people. We'll answer it, and we're going to bail. We've got a couple people upvoting this one. So we'll answer this one, and hopefully it helps some people as well. Hey, Adam, I have a question. The best way to create content without running out of ideas, where can I constantly get post ideas? Okay. Excellent. And I think this should help the most people and then we'll wrap it. We'll try and hop back on this next week. This is going to sound redundant. I said this before, but like, um, content ideas, creativity is, is very much a muscle as well. Uh, Mr. Beast famed YouTube creator. He writes down and, and has been for decades, decade, who knows, long time, 10, 20, 30 ideas a day. Like he just, he writes hundred ideas a day, he writes ideas down all the time. My recommendation is to do the same. I've got a book. It's hiding over there. Um, I write down everything that comes to mind. Anytime I hear of an idea, I write it down. A, a content piece, I write it down. I, I get inspiration, I write it down. Someone asks me a question, 
I write it down. I look through comments on YouTube videos, um, not only to, to make a connection and, and to, to let you know that I see you, but for ideas, for inspiration. It's like, what do you want to know? What can I do to help? Where are you at right now? I'm trying to understand the position that you're in so I can give you the most valuable and relevant information. Uh, look at podcast titles, look at YouTube titles, look at blog posts, go to Google, type in your market, find answers there. Um, there's some other websites. I've got another video coming out on this next week as well that's going to go over some other neat places to do market research on. Uh, go to Amazon, look at the top books in your market, look at the table of contents of those top books, look at the comments that someone has left on the books. I mean, once you start diving in, I think you'll find you, you can literally never run out of ideas. It's like there's always something out there that's going to be relevant and interesting to you and to the market that you want to serve. Ideas are everywhere. I mean, just from those ones that I, I gave you alone, like let's, let's be super conservative here and say you took five from me. So you go to Google, you get five ideas by typing in your keyword, seeing what people are searching. You go down to related searches at the bottom, there's five more ideas. Do it in YouTube, there's five more ideas. Go to um, Amazon, there's five more ideas. Look at the table of contents on Amazon, there's five more ideas. So it's like we got 25 ideas there and you could repeat that with any kind of keyword or idea in your niche, in your market, in your industry, whatever it is, ad infinitum. It just goes on and on forever. There's ideas everywhere. The key is you got to get them out of your head and you've got to write them down. They have to be written down. I'm, I'm air writing, but like you could, you could type them down. You could write them in your phone in a notes app. Just get them out of your head and look at them. And what you'll find is that as you start accumulating ideas, you're going to see the good ones from the bad ones. You're going to be like, that's actually a really good content piece. That one I don't think would work so well. And, and you'll get better over time, but it is a skill that needs to be developed. Fortunately, it's probably one of the easier ones to do. So Whew. With that said, everyone, thank you for being here on this Saturday morning. I appreciate hanging out with me and for all of the absolutely amazing questions. Uh, apologies to everyone that I couldn't get to. There's there's some awesome ones here. I'd love to be able to hop back on this after. Uh, and, and hopefully next week we can repeat it again. If you're here right at, I'm going to try and do it at 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. If you can be here and you can be in first, I'm going to try to get to them chronologically and, um, and we can go from there. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. We'll talk to you soon.